Welcome back to Chicago Independent Television. The Federal Communications Commission is crafting its policy of freedom of speech and action on the internet, known as net neutrality. Chicago played host to a recent series of lectures on this topic. We'll now see the third of these series of lectures as an extended segment. Welcome to the third of these four lectures on net neutrality. In the previous lecture, we examined the policy dimensions of recent history of net neutrality with a particular focus on the years from 2002 onward, extending through various government bodies, the law and the courts, also acknowledging the role that big corporate ISPs and their stranglehold on the American internet market has. But while most of the focus of that discussion on net neutrality is on the legal, policy, and economic back and forth, there's another critical component to the saga that is the focus of this lecture. It's a piece of the puzzle that has been instrumental in keeping the struggle raging for as long as it has. It has not gotten the widespread coverage and analysis it deserves, but its role is nonetheless important and even hopeful. This is the involvement of civil society and the public at large in media policy, particularly on net neutrality. We'll delve into the inspiring history of media policy activism in the last decade and its connections to the net neutrality saga. But first, a word about the struggle of media policy activism. The crux of media policy activism uh, is that largely of building wider awareness. Very often, the policies that big corporations push are hated by the public. But very often, the public doesn't know about those policies until they're enshrined into law and become impossible to dislodge. And even then, the public might not know about these policies. The irony is that the source of information about these policies, the media, have a vested interest in the outcome and are wont to downplay or ignore criticizing or even covering those issues. Activism then becomes a race to inform the wider public and potential allies against the looming danger in order to stop disaster before it happens. The hope is that wider awareness builds outrage that embarrasses the forces of darkness to retreat. We have been fortunate to see that happen a number of times on the net neutrality policy front in the past decade, on the media policy front in the past decade, including a number of times in the net neutrality wars. We will review that history now. In the previous lecture, I mentioned Michael Powell, the former FCC chair turned cable TV lobbyist, who reclassified cable internet modems away from their pro-public stance that they had for much of their history. Around the same time, Powell's FCC, in 2002 and 2003, Michael Powell was also orchestrating a dramatic evisceration of the FCC's media ownership rules. These are the rules that limited media companies, uh, limited for media companies, how many and of what kinds of media they could own in a community and nationally. That matters in that fewer owners with more media made for a worse media environment, with more commercialism, less localism, fewer independent voices, and less diverse perspectives. Over the previous decade, media companies increasingly watered down these rules, and Michael Powell sought to escalate the trend dramatically. The business community salivated over the prospect, and the public was all but unaware of what was to come. So activists around the country, and very fortunate to count myself among them, worked to sound the alarm in every way we could with staging protests holding hearings, publishing op-eds, and also using the internet itself to spread the word. It worked. The resulting outcry didn't stop the FCC in 2003 from carrying through with a vote of their plan, but the outcry reached an estimated 3 million respondents, far more than the FCC had ever gotten on a single docket. That fueled positive congressional action, even with a right-wing Congress at the time, and was acknowledged as the critical factor in a court ruling that blocked the FCC's action for more than seven years on media ownership concentration, and which cooled down the business community's collective erection. What's the connection of this media ownership fight to net neutrality? There are a number of connections. For one, it showed that organizing on media issues is not only possible, but also powerful. Activism on media policy can transcend the usual political divides and can extend across the political spectrum. For another, the internet, the crux regarding net neutrality, is increasingly subsuming the media, 
With more and more media becoming digitized and the internet increasingly upending existing media infrastructure and playing more and more of a role in all of our lives. What's more, the media ownership uprising of 2003 taught lessons that were used in subsequent struggles. Net neutrality was one of those fights, which we'll discuss in much greater detail in a moment. But there were also efforts related to the future of the internet, among them the struggle over community internet. A Supreme Court ruling in 2004 in Missouri upheld laws by the state government that forbid local communities in Missouri from setting up their own community internet initiatives. A number of states had faced the brunt of corporate lobbyists and passed legislation in the wake of that ruling to make illegal the establishment of community internet initiatives. But community activists, raising the specter of corporate dominance of local internet connections, rallied to respond back, including blocking those pro-corporate initiatives in Texas, Louisiana, Iowa, West Virginia, Indiana, and Illinois. It was also in the year 2005 that we saw the Supreme, Court's, uh, Supreme Court uphold the FCC's right to reclassify cable internet in the case involving the small-scale internet service provider from California known as Brand X. So the fight was on for the future of the internet. The vehicle for the pro-corporate ISPs, as mentioned in the last lecture, was the Communications Opportunity Promotion and Enhancement Act of 2006, abbreviated the COPE Act. The activism on the COPE Act echoed what we did to combat the FCC's media ownership rules. We wrote about it. We blogged about it. We contacted like-minded allies about it. We organized around it. One series of actions encompassed a day of coordinated national protests against the COPE Act, which were collectively termed the National Day of Outrage and took place on May 24, 2006. Here in Chicago, a protest was held on Congress Parkway outside what used to be the SBC Center. SBC has since got bought out by AT&T. Actually, SBC bought out AT&T and took the name. That protest took place down the street from the Harold Washington Library Center in Chicago. In New York, a rally was held outside the Verizon World Headquarters. In San Francisco, protesters marched on AT&T Park where the San Francisco Giants play baseball. Um, the COPE Act, despite the increasing grassroots activism against it, passed by a considerable margin in the U.S. House. Next, it had to pass the Senate, and its shepherd there was the late Alaska Senator Ted Stevens. We had mentioned that Ted Stevens had shepherded the committee, even defeating a net neutrality amendment that failed to be included on the final bill by an 11 to 11 tie vote. But the increasing public interest and public concern in the issue was reflected in the questions that were posed by other senators at that committee hearing. That's when Ted Stevens opened his mouth in response. Here is a partial transcript of his response. Quote, 10 movies streaming across that, that internet and what happens to your own personal internet I just, the other day, got an internet was sent by my staff at 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. I got it yesterday, happened to be Tuesday. They wanted to deliver vast amounts of information over the internet. And again, the internet is not something you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's a series of tubes, unquote. That rant would have gone unrecorded had it not been for a single activist with the public interest group Public Knowledge who recorded the audio and posted it online, at which point a blog with the magazine Wired.com reposted the commentary, and the reaction spread swiftly across the series of tubes, even reaching the corporate media, and even getting a segment on The Daily Show, and thereby reaching far wider public awareness. That public, wider public awareness made the bill too re radioactive to bring to a vote. And since it was never brought to a vote in the Senate, the COPE Act died from inaction thus helping the net neutrality cause and keeping net neutrality alive, for now. Consider this, though. Why did senators like Byron Dorgan of North Dakota and Maria Cantwell of Washington go to Ted Stevens into what became a career-defining meltdown? Because of the activism, large and small, at the time, by those working more and more to make net neutrality an issue. The fight over the COPE Act was a bellwether. As is the case with the history of media policy activism, the COPE Act marked a win in the very hardest of fights. The term was in wider discourse, and more people knew about net neutrality and its importance, and in the 
the hardest fight of all made it a thinkable issue that was and is critical in any activism, particularly that in media activism. With the COPE Act defeated, the struggle of terrain returned to the FCC to ensure that the cop on the beat stayed true to the principles. To its credit, that's what happened under the FCC Chair Kevin Martin in 2005, who had established the first flawed policy of net neutrality. Consumers who had used the protocol BitTorrent to use and share very large consumer computer files, as was mentioned in the previous lectures, began to complain of slowdowns in use and activity. Activists affiliated with various nonprofit groups, including folks with the Electronic Freedom Foundation, Public Knowledge, and others, hearing of complaints from Comcast customers for using BitTorrent, started tracking Comcast to see if they were meddling with BitTorrent traffic. When evidence was found in that direction, they filed a formal complaint with the FCC. The FCC, to its credit, heeded the formal complaint and took action. But as you'll recall from the previous lecture, Comcast sued the FCC in response in an attempt to strike down the Commission's net neutrality efforts. And given the Com Commission's reclassification of the internet away into a weaker co pro corporate framework, Comcast succeeded in winning its suit. The milk toast policy efforts on net neutrality continued into the Obama administration, still leaving the reclassification effort off the table. And unsurprisingly, when the FCC voted in 2010 on a second effort at net neutrality, this time with corporate involvement, the FCC lost again in court. Yet in all this time, the buildup among activists continued under the radar for a reclassification of the internet back to the pro-public Title II framework. At least under Title II, activists argued, the FCC stood a far better chance to win in court when it did get sued, as would inevitably be the case. It was on April 23, 2014, that the Wall Street Journal leaked news that the FCC would surrender to the corporate ISPs by allowing what was termed pay, paid prioritization in its net neutrality provisions. The freakout by the public was immediate and massive and encouraging. Within a day's time of the leak, public interest activists got involved in conference calls and starting to chart out subsequent actions. I know, I was invited to those calls. In the subsequent weeks, there were blog posts far and wide. There were activist actions like that announced by one of the co-founders of the website Reddit of buying a net neutrality billboard in the FCC's backyard. There were a host of online videos explaining the policy and its importance. There were multiple net neutrality petitions. There was a round-the-clock encampment outside the FCC in the days leading up to what it was called its Notice for Proposed Rulemaking, the first step in the crafting of any FCC policy. Here in the Chicago area, there was a protest at the FCC's Midwest Bureau on the same day that the FCC would revisit its net neutrality policy. You can even see a documentary video of that protest online. And there was even reporting about the issue across the internet, although as media analysts discovered, there was precious little corporate television coverage of the issue. What else is new? All told, by the time the FCC had held its meeting for its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking on May 15, 2014, the net neutrality docket had fielded an estimated 3.4 million responses. If that's accurate, it would break the FCC's all-time record set by the estimated 3 million responses fielded by the FCC in the media ownership uprising of 2003, a fight that we won and that we plainly wouldn't have won without that massive outcry. What's more, that's an outcry that took place in the days before the policy process began, whereas the Powell-led FCC in its 2003 media ownership proceeding was doing everything to stay out of public view. Did this make a difference? The full story about this latest battle in the net neutrality wars is yet to be written. But there is one very encouraging development. Title II is back on the table. That is, the FCC, in its final notice that was approved by a 3-2 to two vote, has included a reclassification of the Internet back into its pro-public service framework among the options for consideration. Not long ago, even that would have been considered a distant dream. Now, it's up for consideration. And when word of that development leaked, the corporate ISPs lost their collective minds. Within a day, there were opinion pieces and blog posts and letters to the FCC from coalitions of the corporate ISPs and their bought and paid for allies threatening the loss of investment in the internet should the FCC proceed with the reclassification back. So the fight is on now for the internet. 
But as we've seen in this capsule history, the fight has been on for the better part of a decade and longer, from the original ruling in 2002, to the community internet fights in 2005, to the net neutrality wars of 2006, to the new net neutrality wars take two in 2014. If the debate is fair, we win. But as we all know, the debate under our lock and key corporate media and cash laden politicians is seldom fair. The key to winning this fight, as is the case with many media fights, is increasing public involvement. The opposition knew what we know in that they win by trying to ram through policy and locking it in before the public knows about it and would act to block or change it. Therefore, better public policy is directly correlated to more public involvement. The more public involvement and more public involvement is directly connected to more public awareness. That's a truism, I think, and it makes sense. You can't act about something unless you know that there's an issue, unless you know what it's about. And that's the motivation for these lectures, to provide another resource for folks to find out, to learn more, and to encourage people to act in ways large and small. It's how we've kept this fight going for more than a decade. It's how we'll win this fight and other fights to come. And public involvement in these fights have resonated far deeper than just asking the FCC to establish Title II classification for internet connections, though that is quite important. We are presently in the middle of an opportunity that comes maybe once a generation, a critical juncture in which the opportunities for social change are far greater and faster than those in ordinary times. How does that work? What can we do? What are the likely possibilities in the short term? And what are the deeper issues at play? These are all mighty, mighty and important questions and we'll provide some measure of answers to them in the next and last lecture. You're watching Chicago Independent